Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Well, I will start the presentation since I know if uh, people can hear me, I don't see. Uh... Uh, okay, okay, I think uh, you can uh, you can hear me. I will start the presentation, sorry. So hello, I'm Miguel Ojeda. I'm leading the uh, Rust for Linux uh, effort, which is a project uh, that intends to uh, bring uh, Rust into the into the kernel. Uh, and in the talk, uh, I will try to cover uh, um, why Rust is a good idea for for the kernel, or why we think it's a good idea for the kernel, and also give an overview of the of the project. Uh, first of all. Um, I would like to give uh, some uh, credits and acknowledgements because there is a lot of people that have helped uh, this effort. Uh, there is, a, well, I have tried to keep a, a list in the RFC that I sent, uh, that I published, and in the past series. Um, so please go there if you want to uh, see all the credits. Um, also, Raz for being uh, uh, some fresher into the system uh, programming languages uh, ecosystem. Uh, and also for the kernel maintainers uh, in general that we have spoken to uh, so far for being uh, fairly open-minded and uh, being quite uh, interested in the in the effort. So um, I will have to go uh, quite a bit fast into the presentation because the presentation was intended to be 50 minutes long, but uh, in the end we have some uh, I think scheduling problems, so we have to uh, do it short. So I will look, uh, skip probably a couple of things. Uh, so, the history of uh, Linux uh, and C. Basically, Linux and both Linux and, and C, uh, as standardized in, I in ISO, uh, they are both 30 years old uh, and have been hand to hand during all these years uh, and have been developed uh, from time to time uh, in parallel. Although uh, there is, um, there is uh, of course, uh, up and ups and downs in that uh, relationship. Um, so, uh, we will see uh, a bit of those. Uh, it's an easy task to get uh, Rust into the kernel. So, somebody asked these questions uh, some years ago, we will see, uh, which is, do you see any language except C, which is suitable for development of operating systems? Um, and Torvalds, so this comes from the horse mouse, answered, I like interacting with hardware from a software perspective, uh, but I have yet to see a language that comes even close to C, uh, which puts us in a, in a uh, you can imagine this is a hard, uh, it could be perceived as a hard uh, proposition to get a second language into, into the kernel, right? So why Linus Torvalds said this? So why C is a good language for the kernel? So the first thing is, uh, with C, uh, you can use uh, you can use C to generate uh, good code, which means uh, in these terms means uh, fast, basically. Uh, you can also most of the time you can map uh, what is the assembly code that you are going to get when you compile some C code, right? Uh, so we call it this low level. Can say it's low level. Uh, there is also the fact that it's simple. Uh, C is a simple language compared to others. It's a very simple language, even if. I mean, there is always, uh, you know, uh, pitfalls and there is always complexity or the programs that you may write with C uh, may be complex, but still C is, uh, is quite simple. And finally, um, uh, Linus mentioned uh, that C, writing C, uh, for writing code for a, for a, for a, for a, for a computer, uh, using C makes sense. So it fits, I read this as fitting the domain for kernel development. And in fact, C has been used mainly and was kind of designed uh, to write uh, operating systems, write embedded code, write this kind of code that uh, that we have been using it uh, all these years. It has been also used for other things, but the, the point is that uh, it was designed with that in mind, right? It's not Python, it's not some other high-level language, etc. So, and now getting into the real uh, the need of the thing, there is some people call this a disadvantage. Uh, it's not 
so much at disadvantage is more that the C language was designed like that and it's an intrinsic, let's say, an intrinsic property of the language, which is that it has a defined behavior. And defined behavior, uh, if you have heard about, it's like this is a scary thing that uh, people talk about. So we will see what exactly is undefined behavior. And a bit, I'm going a bit quickly, sorry, in order to fit the, the 30 minutes. Uh, and here you see the definition from the C standard. This is taken from the C standard as is, the latest uh, draft. So undefined behavior, uh, in, uh, in informal terms, let's say, uh, is whenever you trigger something that the, the specification of the C language does not give you any semantics uh, uh, and basically gives the freedom to the compiler and to the tool chain to do whatever they want. Uh, this is used for several reasons. The undefined behavior is there in, the, in, the, in, in C for several reasons and it's useful in some cases, for example, for optimization purposes and, and, and other purposes. It's not completely clear uh, what exactly or what is the future of undefined behavior because for example in the C committee we have uh, we are having we are just creating uh, this week uh, a working group uh, on undefined behavior because there is some discussions around this so perhaps this definition may change in the or what it implies exactly may change in the in the in the future standards of C. So let's see one simple example of undefined behavior right one simple example that we can see is division, division by zero that you probably all of you have heard about. So dividing by zero in the integer domain uh, is undefined behavior in C. So you don't get an error, you don't get uh, any kind of exception or anything like that. You basically, the standard says is undefined behavior, which means calling this function with zero in the second argument, the second parameter uh, means uh, you have triggered undefined behavior. And while this may do in your particular platform or for your particular compiler may do something reasonable from your point of view. In general, the standard does not say what uh, this happens. And an optimizer is uh, free to take this as a hint or to perform some other uh, optimization later on, for example. For example, to remove some code path, right? Uh, here, for example, since we know that the defined behavior is uh, B cannot be uh, cannot be zero, uh, if a compiler sees this, we could infer that B has to be different than C. And that's basically logic that optimizes for, for this. Any other inputs that trigger undefined behavior? Yes, there are other inputs in this function, actually, that trigger undefined behavior. There's one more, which is this one. Uh, and uh, for giving you basically an overview of uh, all the kinds of undefined behavior, I put here some uh, uh, a fun slide on, on, on different things that could happen um, that are undefined behavior in C. So all of these that you see are basically taken from the Annex uh, J from the C standard, which is basically a list of all the possible undefined behaviors that are in, in the C standard. It doesn't, um, uh, it's, it may not be a complete list, let's say, but it's a good uh, way to learn about undefined behavior and to see more or less what are the main uh, sources of undefined behavior if uh, you are new to the to the concept. Uh, but here, if you see in this slide, which is yeah, it's all messy and so on, but if you see here, I have annotated or I have uh, highlighted some of the things that are actually uh, interesting. There are some words, keywords that appear here, like lifetime, pointer, strap representations, data races, all these. Uh, if you have seen some Rust or you know about a bit, a bit of these, are basically words that you will hear then if you learn Rust. Um, so you see that this Rust is related a bit on, on this and has done some work on that. So that has been seen. What Rust offers? What is uh, why? Which is the, the key question. Why do we want Rust in the kernel? And there is one single, one single, and this is the key feature that Rust has. And everything else, at least from my point of view, is completely secondary. There are many other things that I will mention. Uh, I don't have time to get into all the features that Rust has, of course, but there is one key feature, and this is the main thing we want, why I and other people want Rust in the kernel, and in other systems, not just the kernel, which is it doesn't have undefined behavior in the safe subset. There are some conditions that need to apply for this to be true, to, for this uh, statement to hold, but in general, to simplify, we can say Rust does not have undefined behavior in the safe subset, and as long as there are no bugs in unsafe code, et cetera, et cetera. So that's fine. Rust doesn't have undefined behavior. That's uh, simple. That's fine. But sometimes you have may heard or you have read. If you are new to Rust, you have heard what is uh, you have heard the sentence like uh, Rust is memory safe or Rust is safe or is safer than Rust uh, than C. Sorry, or is safer than C++. But what exactly means safe? 
for Rust. When you hear Rust is safe or the Rust programs you write are safe, what exactly that means? And this is the one key thing to understand in order to understand Rust and exactly to understand why we want it in the kernel. And I kept talking about in the previous slides about undefined behavior because this is the, where I use this term. So safety in Rust is exactly, at least currently in the current uh, specification, there is no specification for Rust, there is no complete reference, there is no complete specification, but what we have now is uh, uh, that safety in Rust means there is no undefined behavior. And here, when I say similar to C, I mean that undefined behavior, I'm using undefined behavior, the term undefined behavior in, in a similar sense to the C1, right? Because the languages are different, Rust may happen to define uh, undefined behavior slightly different or have different instances of undefined behavior. So don't think that all the undefined behavior from C translates into, into, into Rust. But the concept basically is the same. Uh, there are things that you cannot do in your program or you risk basically uh, your program having any kind of behavior uh, possible. And critically, this is different than what you have heard also, uh, if you know about safety critical or you, are, uh, you, you have no work in some of these domains, there is this safety critical thing that you may have heard of Ada and other, other kind of languages, Spark, etc. There is, safety critical is not what Rust is providing. And this, I want to be extra clear on this because Rust does not provide safety critical uh, as in functional safety. So this is a standard that I mentioned there for airborne applications, for cars, for rain, for trains, sorry, and other kinds of applications. Rust, when they say, or when we say Rust is safe, we don't mean it's safe in the sense of putting it in a plane, putting it in a car, or putting it in a train. Okay, you can do safety critical software in C. You can also do it in the future, most probably in Rust. You can do it in many languages, but this is not what safe means. Okay, so to try to give, drive this point uh, home, I want to put some examples of uh, what is Rust safe. What I what I what I mean here by Rust safe, I mean safe in the sense of Rust, so non undefined behavior, right? You can also call it. Uh, undefined behavior less or UV less, like I usually like to, to talk about. I, I usually say this is UV less, okay, instead of saying uh, Rust safe. So for example, we say Rust, at least in the safe subset, subset, is safe, right? What it means. So take, for example, the abort function. If you are a C programmer, you know about the abort function, of course, from the standard library, which basically uh, uh, stops the, terminates the program uh, in a, a normal uh, way. Basically, you, you, you kill the program. Uh, so this is safe or not? Because the abort function on its own, there are other ways, but let's not get into there, but on its own, calling abort, that's not trigger undefined behavior. And therefore, abort is a safe function. Abort, if you call abort, it's completely safe. And uh, this is something that may shock, because the, this, this is why I, I was talking about the functional safety, because if you, sorry, I need to go to the slide. You may imagine that you call abort, you kill your business because uh, you call abort your whatever uh, system is business critical and your company goes bankrupt because you lost all your clients. That is completely Rust safe. That is not defined behavior, that is completely fine. Also, if somebody is injured because you are doing a safety critical application, if you call abort, that is completely Rust safe, but it's not, of course, safe in the functional safety sense. Okay? So here in this slide, I will not go into this ever. Basically, imagine that we take the f function from before and we say, let's try to make this f function to write it in a way that there is no way to consider undefined behavior, no matter what the inputs are to the function. So we can test for the conditions that trigger undefined behavior in the operation below, and we can say, okay, we just abort. Um, and in this case, what we say is that the function is safe. And this is a term from Rust. If we would say, if this was a Rust function, of course, we would say this is a safe function because there are no other conditions that, there is no way, there is no data path, there is no, sorry, no code path uh, that can trigger undefined behavior in this function, no matter what the input. So, other example of Rust safety, what it, what it implies to be Rust safe. So, Rust panics. Rust panics when you panic in Rust, which is basically, uh, it depends well on the mode uh, where the program is compiled, but in general, think about it like an abort. If you panic in Rust, that's also safe. Even if it is counterintuitive, it's completely safe. Also, kernel panics, since the context of this talk is the kernel. So there are also usually discussions uh, around that, oh, but if panic in the kernel is not safe, cannot be safe. Well, in the Rust sense, it's safe. Of course, it's 
a very bad thing to do and you don't want to ever do it if you can avoid it but this is safe in the in the in the in the sense of rust so what is not safe right so there is all these things i list here like use after uses after free out of bound accesses uh, double freeze etc etc all those things are not rust safe because all all those things trigger undefined behavior and this means that this um, these things, even if you trigger them sometimes, and you know if you have a problem in C, sometimes you trigger undefined behavior and you perhaps do not see it in debug configuration or in release configuration, or sometimes you upgrade your compiler version and suddenly your program is not working. So even if you trigger these things, your system may still work, but those are not safe in the sense of Rust. Okay, and so enough of safety. Uh, so what, the, what else, apart from the safety aspect uh, Rust offers, right? So we have uh, the language. The language is uh, very um, is featureful, has a lot of uh, things that it offers. Uh, for example, the safe and safe split that uh, you have in the bottom left side. There are a lot of things that perhaps you have heard about. It's, uh, it's a very nice language. And uh, I think many of these features are very useful for the kernel as well. But again, all these features, the main one is the safety and the, and the UBLS uh, property. And in fact, some of the features like lifetime generics, uh, the exclusive and self references, et cetera, et cetera, and the safe and safe split, all these things are used to, to be able to uh, effectively be UBLS and, and uh, avoid, for example, some runtime checks, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the standard library. Uh, the free standard library is basically the one for embedded, as you know, uh, the, the one uh, when you are not uh, in user space, when you are writing the operating system, for example. And this is important for a kernel. And we already have in Rust, we already have many things done, which are very nice and they are very well done. I, I really like this part of Rust, uh, especially, for example, the vocabulary, vocabulary types that I mentioned, the result and option. This allows you, for example, to do error handling in a, in a not standardized, but in a, in a, how to say, in a, in, in a way that you don't have different ways of handling errors or different types for different kinds of errors or different, uh, for example, um, ways to encode the error. For example, sometimes there is a zero, sometimes there is a one that represents the error, other times it's the opposite. Uh, this goes away completely with these types, which is very nice to have in the standard library. That's why it's important to have them there so that everyone uses them. Um, then finally, we have tooling. Uh, tooling is also very important, including for the kernel. And there are a lot of things we already used. Some of these we already use in the, in the, in the kernel. And of course, there is also uh, GDB, LLDB, perf, balkan, all these things that are used in the kernel. These also work with Rust. So all these things basically uh, just work. Uh, well, there may be some hiccups on some things that we need to uh, improve or fix, but in general, it's prepared for that. So where is the catch, right? There is these all nice things about Rust, but uh, there has to be a catch. Where is the catch or where's the catch? The first thing is you cannot model everything in this safe subject. So sometimes unsafe code is required and I cannot extend myself here. Sorry, I have to be quick. Uh, in order to model some things, you have to provide more information, for example, lifetimes, or you have to use generics, or you have to use some, some feature of Rust. And this means that you have to use a more complex language. Some of, some of the features you don't need to use, but in general, I would say that if you want to write, for example, idiomatic Rust code, or you want to be, uh, you need them. So it's a more complex language and using it Idiomatically uh, requires uh, more learning than, for example, compared to C. If you compare uh, the language side by side, just on the complexity of the features they offer. There are some extra runtime checks in some cases. You can always avoid them with unsafe code, like you do in C. Basically, you can always skip a runtime check if you can prove your, on your own that uh, something is safe. That it's not going to trigger undefined behavior. But uh, in general, if the compiler does not have enough information to prove that, uh, and you call one of these functions that cannot be proven, then it will do runtime checks unless you use the unsafe version of the function. So normally you have both, you have the safe version and the unsafe version, so that you can uh, you have flexibility there. You are not constrained to always use unsafe uh, things if you need for performance reasons, for example. And finally, this is the biggest one uh, I, I find, is that it's an extra language plan. So there is logistics, there is maintenance board, and we have to be careful about um, putting a second language in the kernel. Any language that goes into the kernel, any second language is going to introduce a major burden uh, to maintainers, to people that need to learn, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the major thing, and this is what we are uh, working on now. Um, so going back to the slide that we had on why C was a good language for the kernel, let's compare with Rust, right? 
So is Rust a good language uh, for the kernel? So the first point was, this is fast. Yes, you can generate fast code with, uh, with Rust. Um, sometimes you have, as I said, these runtime checks, et cetera, et cetera. But in general, if you take care, and even if you need to reach for I'm safe in some small case, you can write a uh, good code with it. And we use LVM as the backend. There is also GCC, I will mention it later. So yes, we can generate good code for as good as C or C++ or any other language like that. Then the low level point, sometimes, because if you write some kind of function, then yes, you can map very easily what Rust is going to do in the, in the, uh, in the output. Uh, in the compiler, you can guess more or less what is assembly language that you are going to get, but in other cases, you will not be able to, to do it. In some cases, for example, if you start using fancy iterators and you have to st start changing things, then you may get code that is really not, uh, not say readable, but uh, well, we could also say readable, but uh, the point is that there is there are some things that uh, really um, uh, do not look as nice as, as you would see in C. So it's not as easy as to map in some cases. And then the simplicity, this is a point that I have to say no. Uh, anybody that has learned C uh, and has learned Rust, there is more features, there is more things you need to have in your mind. But this is good because we are trading that. The, the trade-off is that you employ that time to try to get as much errors as possible at compile time. You want to remove undefined behavior. You want to remove other kinds of logic impacts, for example, through the type six, et etc. Et but that is a trade-off. Uh, the language is more complex and there is no denying on that. For example, on a, co on a comparison with C++, I would say Rust is simpler than C++, but not so much. So the, you need to, uh, this needs to be clear, Rust needs some learning, and while it's not as complex as C++, there is some complexity there, and it's much complex, uh, much more complex than C in that sense. Also fit the domain, I could extend myself here, but uh, it depends who you ask. Uh, but yeah, let's just go forward. Um, so it's a nice task. It depends. Uh, it depends. Uh, uh, if you if you take a look here, uh, I I go into back to the slide. Torvalds said this uh, a decade ago, and a decade ago, Rust was not a thing, or at least it was in the design process. So perhaps we have a chance of convincing Torvalds, and this is a bit of a in I mean it's a bit of a a joke or running joke because uh, of course we want uh, the everyone to be uh, uh, involved, and we want to to try to convince as many kernel maintainers as possible, not just uh, Linux or Greg or anybody else above. So we want that actually the kernel community is on board with us and try to get Rust uh, as a second language, a first class second language, let's say. To the kernel. So maybe we have a chance to convince Torba, but this is uh, for fun. Rust supporting the kernel, this is the other part of the talk. And the first part I would discuss, if I had more time, I would discuss a bit more how everything works. But what I want to focus here on uh, is the kernel script. So in the Rust, there is the Rust tree and there is the Linux tree, the source code, I mean. And for example, from the Rust tree, currently we use the core and alloc crates. And the alloc crate uh, is, we have a copy in the Linux tree right now, but because we have extended it with some features, but eventually the idea is that the alloc crate, uh, the upstream alloc crate merges the features we need, and then we can remove that from the, from the Linux tree. Um, and the most important part here to focus on is on the kernel crate and the bind gen. The bind gen that you see at the uh, right side, which is uh, in the yellow color, bind gen is a tool that generates automatically the interfaces for C code. So basically, instead of writing ourselves the signatures of all the C functions, automatically generates all the signatures parsing the C code. So we use this. We, use, we, we go through the subsystems that we need, the functions that we need, and we generate them automatically with bind gen. But, and this is where I will go to the next one, from the driver point of view, this is how it works. And this is the critical point. This, this is one of the critical points. So let's say in the left side, we have a driver, right? In the driver tree, in the driver, um, yeah, in the driver tree, we have, a, for example, a subsystem called foo, and we have a my foo driver. And the my foo driver, the key is that only calls the kernel crate, right? The kernel crate here is a design uh, thing that may change in the future, but the point is it only calls abstractions of the subsystems. This is Rust code. This has been already abstracted. We say abstractions in the sense that we have tried to wrap all the unsafe code and make it safe so that drivers do not need to use unsafe code as much as possible. There are some cases we cannot avoid, the, some, some small cases, but there are many, many cases more than you may think initially that you, we can actually remove all the undefined behavior from that. 
So the line below that you see, the forbidden line, is that when you start writing Rust code in the kernel, you want to, for example, call a C function because you need to do that, right? You need to call some, some C functions, either through the generated ones through binding, or either you write a signature and you skip binding and, and you try to do FFI directly to, to the include, to, the, to whatever function the kernel you need. So the point here is, no, the drivers are forbidden. Right now, we are still in the process of uh, removing some of these usage, uh, early usage of that. But the point is, drivers minimize the, safe, the unsafe code that they need, right? So if we follow this design and we are strict about it, we will be able to write drivers with as much safe code as possible, which is the, the, the entire key of, of this effort. Then we have supported architectures. I will not get into that. There is possibility to support even more. We have uh, basically, as soon as we get the GCC uh, code path uh, for the code generation, we, we will be able to target uh, all of them. So this is a solvable problem, basically. There are different, talking about that, there are different uh, code, code paths to generate code. Uh, there is the main compiler, which features a Rust uh, frontend, uh, the, the, the frontend that everyone uses, basically, and uh, LLVM backend. So LLVM is the one generating the code. There is also now, it's going to be merged, it's already merged uh, this day, so it's basically this month is probably getting merged on the next one, which is a code gen, a backend for GCC. So we will be able to use GCC very soon, like in one month, to generate kernel code for uh, for, for the kernel. So exactly the same language, no different language, because the front end is the same. And then there is Rust GCC. Rust GCC is a new front end. So it's using GCC, and it's going to be eventually, hopefully, uh, uh, merged into mainline GCC. But it's a completely new front. It's a new implementation of the Rust compiler. And this we also hope to support and use uh, when it's ready. They are working on it very hard. They have some funding, and they are doing it. I have been told, but it's a very, very rough estimate that in one, two years, they may have something near to, to compile the kernel code that we need. Uh, and now I will give you some examples of how things look. And this is the end, basically, of the talk. Documentation. Documentation. Um, as you see here, there is a, this is the Rust documentation you have seen it before. This is the kernel documentation, the one that we generate. And the idea is to put this in kernel.org alongside the other kernel documentation. The normal kernel documentation is generated through Sphinx, which you know this this instant to write uh, Doxygen like uh, uh, comment, etc. To comment see things. But in Rust, we wanted to use the Rust native native uh, way of documenting functions, modules, etc., etc. And it looks like that. And uh, you can click on all these things. It's a search function that works very very nice. Everything is linked together. The documentation generator understands the, the Rust uh, elements or Rust. Uh, elements of the language and, and can link everything. So for example, you see there in the, in the screenshot many hyperlinks and you can click everywhere and you can very easily uh, go through the code. Um, we have then, uh, this is another page of the documentation. You see the signature of, uh, let's say signature, the definition without the without the body of abstract in Rust, for example, a mutex that we have all the documentation. We are trying to be strict in documenting of this code. Uh, you can click on seeing the source code directly in the web page. You can click the source code. It's all highlighted. You can you will be able soon to even click on these things in the source code there, like you do, for example, in Elixir, in Woodlin, in the Woodlin page to, to uh, cross-reference kernel code. And even eventually, we will, this is the result, search, research, sorry, search result page. And eventually, um, we want to cross-link the Sphinx documentation from the kernel with this so that we can cross-link all the documentation as well. And this is doable, and I am already in the talks with uh, with the Fox uh, to, to do that, uh, the Rust talk Fox. Now, an example of how that documentation looks in the code, very very quickly. This is how it looks. So, as you see, actually, the, there's an example there, right? Uh, that is highlighted and everything. And uh, well, this is basically how how it looks. The documentation It's very simple to write. There is no fancy. You don't have to remember the oxygen and stuff. It's just Markdown, and that's it. Basically, it's, it's Markdown. It's very easy. There is we support additional compilation uh, in, the, in the kernel. We can use, you know, as in the, you do in the C code, you can you can use whether something you can conditionally compile whether is something is a module or not, etc. Cetera, et cetera. We are following some strict DAC guidelines. I will not get into them. Uh, we are aiming to be as strict as possible. We are trying to do uh, to have quality code quality as good as in the in the standard library of Rust. Uh, here is an example of the abstraction. We cannot get into all the details, but this is how an abstraction would look like. This would be a file of the kernel. This is the implementation of, uh, of some methods of the, of the type. 
Uh, this is an example of driver code that you can take a look uh, offline. Uh, this, if you want to take a look better, this was done by Wesson, this comparison. Wesson Almeida, Almeida Filo uh, has this in the blog post, in a Google blog post, and we also have uh, Linux Weekly News has uh, LWN has uh, the example as well listed. Testing, we also have testing. This is how testing works in Rust. Uh, I cannot go into that if we want to have some, some more questions. Uh, but basically, we have integration tests, we have unit tests, uh, not running yet in the kernel, but the, the idea is to have uh, these tests, that these are the native way of writing Rust tests, integrated with the kernel so that you can write tests that run in the kernel, for example, at boot, like in QUnit, self-test, etc. Et this is still a working problem. Uh, this is a test. So documentation tests are also in Rust. So you write some example here, and we will be able to compile this, and we will be able to see um, we will be able to, to, to keep this example compiling. So we know it's compiling and we also know it's working. And this is very important because um, we already have found that we can find problems with this. I mean, if you compile the example, those are, it's, it's a key property and it's something I really love about the documentation system in Rust to be able to compile examples. And finally, if you want to see more details, we have a workshop that this, uh, this year will be uh, invitation only next week. But the plumbers, if you want to see more details, we will have some talks in plumbers with more details about all this. And finally, well, um, the conclusion is that right now the step we are in, the stage of the project we, we, in which we are right now is we are trying to convince, convince the overall or a majority or at least as much as possible of the kernel community, community especially the maintainers, so that they see that Rust is, uh, uh, is, is something worth to, to, to put in the kernel and, and try to get uh, them uh, to help us and, and to, to, to write Rust code as well. So this is it. If there is any uh, questions, um, I didn't see any marked in the... Uh, let me see. Yeah. I see the chat. I didn't see any, any questions yet. I don't know if I have a problem with this because I since I don't see anyone, I don't know if... Uh, I'm missing the, the ones. I, I, I see the public chat, but I don't see any questions. Um, okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, I see the chat, yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, so, well, so if there is no questions, I can take the two minutes, perhaps, I don't know, to... Yeah, to put uh, this slide, which was the one that we went uh, quickly over. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I know that some people want to know more. Some folks have told me that they want to know more details about the project. But again, the, the project is uh, what the state we are in is we need to convince the kernel community at large to, to accept this. And then uh, we already have some, some uh, kernel maintainers that have approached us and we have already their go ahead to put some Rust code for them into the kernel. So they will support the code for their subsystem in the, in the, in the kernel. And I think it's, uh, it's very nice that people are stepping forward. And as soon as we get a few users, I think this, uh, this will start uh, growing the kernel. Uh, the possibilities of Rust in the kernel are, I think, uh, quite important. Uh, of course, the undefined behavior is the main one, uh, but also the all the rest of the features, I think, are, are important. For example, one of the ideas I had for the for the kernel is the rec map, uh, the register map uh, thing that we have, basically a memory map for devices. Right now it's done at runtime in the kernel, but we could have used exploit the, the macros, uh, the macros features in, in Rust to create at compile time directly very easily uh, all the functions, safe functions, not unsafe ones, to read write memory addresses and everything. So this is, for example, uh, one of the things we could do and we discussed in the past. Uh, some folks thought, oh, perhaps we cannot do um, Perhaps we cannot uh, read write the memory addresses safely, but we can if we generate some code at compilation time. And uh, of course, there are cases you cannot escape and safety. But in general, I think we we have uh, we have a nice uh, path forward. And uh, we already have some. There will be some new news soon in the next weeks. Uh, of uh, yeah, we got a question. So the first uh, one of them is GPIO. Uh, we have the GPIO maintainers are okay with that. So probably it will be uh, GPIO. We will also have NVMe, but the NVMe one is uh, is more as an example of, of how it works, a complex 
one. But the actual first user, I think that we will have in the kernel, the first user will be GPIO. Yeah. So though that will probably uh, may change in the next two weeks, but uh, probably the first real user that we mainline is, is GPIO. So thank you everyone for coming to the talk and uh, I will see you in uh, LPC and that's what.